Rakuten is proud to present Elizabeth the First, the new podcast about Elizabeth Taylor as the original influencer. She was famous for her impeccable style, and Rakuten wants to help you save on the styles you love. Shopping for the perfect holiday party outfit? Rakuten makes it possible with cash back, deals, and coupons. Save money at stores you love. Get started at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N, Rakuten.com. You're probably tired of me telling you about how sturgeon shortages in the Caspian Sea brought Eastern Europeans to Missouri in search of a cheap caviar substitute. But I just discovered that on the other side of the lake, someone else had spotted the caviar crisis too. And in that crisis, they saw an opportunity. All right, we're at Low Sage Caviar Company. We're going to go inside and meet Steve, the owner, and learn more about the only company that legally sells paddlefish roe in Missouri. Hi, Steve. We spoke. I'm Aaron. Aaron, how are you? Yeah, thank you so much for having us. My name is Steve Cars, and uh, my family owns Osage Cat Fisheries. Uh, it was established by my father, Jim Cars, and my mom in 1953, and uh, have expanded from a small little bait shop that served some of the old resorts here at Lake of the Ozarks in the early 50s to now we ship all over the world. Steve says his father, Jim, was an entrepreneurial visionary. Back in the 70s, Jim started thinking about making caviar from paddlefish after he read about collapsing sturgeon populations in the Caspian Sea. In the late 70s, there was a lot of poaching and destruction of the beluga sturgeons in Russia and in Iran because of the Iranian hostage thing, you know, the sanctions being put on that country. Iran also borders the Caspian Sea. It used to be one of the world's biggest and best caviar exporters. But after the 1979 Islamic Revolution, when more than 50 American diplomats were taken hostage, the U.S. imposed severe economic sanctions against Iran. It became increasingly difficult for the country to trade on the international market, and its caviar industry was decimated. Well, that caught my dad's attention. So Jim starts buying paddlefish from fishermen in Oklahoma and Mississippi. He sets up a paddlefish farm on the ponds dotted around his property. All of our friends said, oh, you're crazy. There's no market for it. You know, what are you doing? You know, the the fish have to be 10 to 12 years old, you know, to produce eggs. You know, you're going to have so much invested in it. What are you going to do it? Well, he loved to challenge. After years of trial and error, Jim and his sons finally succeed in getting the paddlefish to breed. I think we're kind of unique because we are a self-contained farm. We're taking them from egg to adult, and uh, not very many people do that. I asked Steve whether he remembers the roadhouse bust. Oh, yeah, it was a big deal down here. Whenever it happened, it was a big deal. Because the feds were involved in that one, too. Yeah. Just from what you saw in the papers or heard on the news, it was a pretty elaborate, organized group that was uh, purchasing these eggs and processing them. It was East Coast nationals buying up the eggs and shipping them back into uh, Europe. Black market, period. It's no surprise that Operation Roadhouse Gossip made its way across the lake. I'm wondering whether or not to tell Steve that the claims of a caviar mafia shipping eggs back to Europe may not be entirely accurate, but the moment passes. I've heard horror stories about this illegal stuff where they, you know, out in the open and it's not temperature controlled and all that stuff, and they're selling it, you know. Steve explains that when a female paddlefish is put under severe stress, she releases a chemical onto her eggs, which can be harmful to humans. If that fish is out of the water and not being in any sort of life support like what we do in between harvest and the processing facility, poor quality. But they can cover it up with salt. Gross. In Warsaw, I'd heard more than a few accounts of fishermen gutting paddlefish while they're still breathing. 
then just tossing them back to die. A lot of times they don't care. You know, people, if they're shipping it back into a country that demands a lot of caviar for ethnic purposes, you know, because in some places caviar is served at every special event there is, especially into Russia, birthdays, anniversaries, that's a big deal. It doesn't matter. You know, as long as there's a black caviar on the table, it, it's there. But even though Steve fiercely opposes poaching, he's also worried about overzealous crackdowns. And that's because he's seen the tragic consequences firsthand. A few years ago, a Ukrainian man was working for Steve, helping the company as it tried to break into the lucrative Russian market. This guy is hardworking and inquisitive. He wants to know everything there is to know about paddlefish. Well, somebody over on the other side of the lake said there's a Russian here wanting to buy caviar. Steve's Ukrainian employee was living in the U.S. legally, but that didn't stop conservation agents from raiding his home. Missouri Department of Conservation raided his place where he was staying because they thought he was a Russian trying to buy illegal caviar. Well, they didn't take the time to listen to him to know that he was dealing with us. It was a really sad deal. It stressed him out so bad, he actually had a heart attack and was in the hospital up here because they came with their black jackets and all these cars with their lights on. And if they would just taken the time to contact us, it never would have happened. There was an atmosphere of panic about paddlefish poaching. Everyone wanted to protect the fish and stop the dead carcasses piling up. And remember, everyone thought that it was the Russian mafia or an international smuggling operation. So suddenly, anyone with an Eastern European name or accent was seen with suspicion. To be fair, like most things in life, it wasn't a black and white situation. It wasn't good cops versus bad poachers. But despite its success on paper, I wonder if Operation Roadhouse left a trail of collateral damage. Like this innocent Ukrainian man caught in the crossfire. I'm Helen Holliman. From Imperative Entertainment and Vespucci, this is The Paddlefish Caviar Heist, Episode 7, The Real Black Market. If you think cash back at thousands of your favorite stores sounds too good to be true, think again. With Rakuten, you can save on whatever you're buying for the holidays. So while you're getting gifts for friends and family, get some cash back for yourself, too. Don't forget festive home decor, party outfits, and that trip to see your fam. Because shopping for everything is much more magical with cash back. Rakuten makes it so easy. Here's how it works. Rakuten partners with stores you know and love. Places like American Eagle, Aveda, Finish Line, GameStop, Lancome and more. These stores actually pay Rakuten for sending them shoppers. And Rakuten shares that money with you as cash back. You can even stack coupons and deals on top of cash back. Cha-ching! Shop at Rakuten.com or by using the Rakuten app and you'll get your cash back payments through PayPal or check. It's that easy. Start your holiday shopping with Rakuten now to save money at over 3,500 stores. Join for free at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N. Rakuten.com. The world is always on, but you shouldn't be. Put junk sleep to bed. At Mattress Firm's Black Friday sale, save up to 60% on beauty rest with queen mattresses starting at $399.99. Only at Mattress Firm. Restrictions apply. See store or mattressfirm.com for details. In the last episode, Peter Babenko's lawyer told us that he hadn't seen evidence of an international poaching ring. He thinks the whole sting operation was blown out of proportion, and that instead of admitting fault, the government went on to prosecute his client as though he was part of a greater conspiracy. I wanted to share this perspective with the Department of Conservation's Randy Doman. We did speak to one of the defendants who I think had probably one of the most severe rulings, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, his lawyer said to the effect that he felt like the department sort of threw the book in terms of the charges. How would you respond to that? 
I will say this, the state of Missouri, uh, the Missouri Department of Conservation and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service take the protection of the people's fish, forest, and wildlife resources seriously. The citizens of this state and this is the North American model of conservation, they trust us to manage their fish, forest, and wildlife resources. And that's a responsibility that we don't take lightly. The people expect us to take it seriously. Our job in these investigations is to gather the facts, present the cases for the prosecutors and the judges to make the decision on the severity of the penalties. And of course, those folks are elected by the people. That's our model here in the United States. If the prosecutors and the judges felt like that they were grossly exploiting the resources and they're serving the will of the people, then they probably use appropriate discretion in levying the penalties. No a good defense attorney is going to do what good defense attorneys do and always try and downplay the severity of their client's violations and that sort of thing. I get that. But I trust the judgment of the prosecutors and judges in this case. And I'm extremely proud of the officers who documented such a large scale amount of violations to help the prosecutors and judges do their job. And I think they did it quite well in this case. So what was the prosecution's defense of Operation Roadhouse? I was curious to know, so I went back over the court documents. Sure enough, buried in the text of Bogdan Nahapetian's sentencing memo is the government's justification for supporting this elaborate sting. Here's my producer, Aaron, quoting directly from the sentencing memo. The continued existence of paddlefish in Missouri for future generations depend upon law enforcement officers, prosecutors, and courts treating these violations like the serious crimes that they are. If we cannot replace false rationales such as, we shouldn't need a license to do this, or they'll never find out, with the simple thought, this is wrong, perhaps we can at least instill a fear of the outcome if detected. This is the essence of deterrence. So was Operation Roadhouse less about bringing down a grand poaching conspiracy and more about sending a message? If you come for our fish, then we'll come for you. It's hard to say for sure. Maybe the media are to blame? As a journalist, I can relate to the impulse of wanting to make a story appear extraordinary in order to cut through the noise. Is that what happened here? Did Operation Roadhouse become something of a myth inside newsrooms and police briefings? Personally, I'm still not buying it. Based on everything I've learned, it does seem very likely that some of these guys were selling Paddlefish Row on the black market. But that begs the question, how do you define the black market? When I spoke to an undercover agent who didn't want to go on the record, he had an interesting theory. On one end, there's roe being falsely labeled as premium caviar and sold to fancy restaurants and ethnic food stores like Peter Babanko's. And at the other end, you've got the small scale stuff. Like guys in the neighboring town of Sedalia who are over harvesting eggs to share with friends and family. But when you consider the number of people caught in Operation Roadhouse, over 100, all that roe, it adds up. We may never know for sure who was behind it all or whether I was complicit, and that's gonna haunt me. But Russian mafia or not, poaching is poaching. Back on Warsaw's Main Street, it's lunchtime. We head to our favorite restaurant. We dig into Greek salads and catch up again with Bailey, who we met in the first episode. As we chat about Operation Roadhouse and the Russian mafia angle, it's clear that Bailey has nothing but admiration for the conservation department. Our conservation agents are so amazing. They're like straight up CSI, just like all over it. They're so wonderful. And we all know that they're always out here trying to do the best they can for conservation because, I mean, we're really lucky to be able to snag here. And we don't want to mess it up. <laughs> we don't want to lose the opportunity. We want to be able to do it for as long as we can. For Bailey, it doesn't matter exactly who was doing the poaching, because despite everyone's best efforts, Warsaw's overfishing problem has never really gone away. Just this last year, there are some creeks out here that we like to go look for arrowheads and things like that. 
we were taking my son to go look at this creek and someone had just driven over the bridge and dumped like seven or eight carcasses of spoonbill right in this creek and it's just sitting there rotten. You can smell it from a mile away. Bailey tells me just a year ago, the cops stopped a big van down at the harbor, not far from where we're sitting. They found huge ice chests in the back loaded up with buckets of paddlefish eggs. Even Steve the bull rider, the fisherman we spoke to at Rick's Ore House, tells us he's seen recent busts on the dock there. Everybody heard, everybody saw. I mean, there were photos of them down there with their van and photos of the coolers, and it was, it was a big deal. <laughs> everybody heard about it. They weren't from here. Um, they were some kind of Eastern European, I would say. They were definitely not locals. These recent busts remind me of what Randy Doman said about his department's duty to act on local concerns. And preserving snagging culture? It's a huge worry. We want our kids to be able to do it, our grandkids. It's, it's very nostalgic. It's the generational thing. You know, most people, it's not like, oh, I just decided to go snagging one day. It's, oh, well, you know, my parents went snagging and my grandparents went snagging and it's something we've all done together. And it's something that you just pass on and get to experience together as a family. And you make so many great memories. We're really lucky to be able to do it. It's, I get pretty excited about it. <laughs> One thing that strikes me is that in this battle between locals and Eastern Europeans, something has been totally lost in translation. These prehistoric fish are deeply loved by both communities for entirely different reasons. There's no doubt in my mind that some of the Roadhouse players did want to exploit the paddlefish for cash. But for these fishermen, from Russia, Ukraine, and other former Soviet republics who find themselves living in America? Is caviar the thing that connects them back to the world they left behind? A world in which an abundance of caviar has been replaced by scarcity. I wonder if some of these guys went on a fool's errand in the name of reconnecting with a taste of home, that you can never go back to. Maybe each spoonful is a briny time capsule that takes them back to the days when caviar was as cheap as butter and generously lathered on bread at every family gathering. It kind of reminds me of something historian Nicola Fletcher said about the power food has to evoke memories. Any sort of diaspora anywhere in the world the people take their culture and they have this longing for the homeland. And in some people, it does become a bit of an obsession or a craving, <laughs> and they sort of almost feel they have to have it all the time. And that's what I mean about it becoming a bit of an obsession. They crave these things in order to keep this link with the homeland. All the years I've spent in the food world, I know one thing to be true. Food is home. A ritual that connects us to our ancestors, our present, and our futures. Years ago, I was in my parents' kitchen. It was the day after Christmas. For whatever reason, I got the overwhelming urge to make red-eye gravy and biscuits, a classic Southern dish that I've eaten at family gatherings for years. I had never made it before. I had no recipe, just my intuition. My mom came into the kitchen, took a bite, and her face turned to shock. Where did you get this recipe? She asked me. I made it up, I told her. She told me she hadn't tasted this since my granddad made it for her as a kid. These rituals offer comfort for the people and traditions that we've lost whether it's through conflict, migration, or just the passage of time. Food becomes a kind of medicine, a powerful bond between us and within communities. I wonder if there's some way for Warsaw locals and fishermen of all backgrounds to reach an understanding, 
while protecting these fish for future generations. Nothing justifies the crime, whatever the reason. All of these small actions, every fish snagged and gutted, adds up to a devastating loss. When you strip away the mafia, sting operations, and black market, this is a story about the lengths people will go to to preserve their culture, whether in the Ozarks or the other side of the world. As we pull out of our parking spot in front of the landing bar and grill, I remember something in my bag. Earlier that day at the Paddlefish Ranch, Steve had given us a parting gift, a tin of his caviar. You didn't really think I was gonna leave Missouri without at least tasting this infamous snack, did you? Opening the lid, they're kind of a, a greenish colored hue that are glistening. They actually don't smell too bad. They don't smell like anything, really. Being classy connoisseurs, me and Aaron are sitting in the car, parked up outside a gas station. Truly glamorous. My handy favorite way to eat caviar. It's a bit taboo. I'm opening a bag of chips, because I don't have a spoon. Dipping a chip in here. Ooh, look at those beads. Yep, that tastes like paddlefish. You know, this paddlefish, I'm really impressed with the fact that the beads were as poppy as they were. That was surprising. The flavor of this is very much tastes like the terroir of where it is to me. It tastes like Truman Lake. I can taste the river, but it's still much better than I remembered. Influencer. It's a word that gets tossed around a lot these days. But what exactly is an influencer? Well, there is a woman who went the distance, who went beyond the dazzle, who broke ground as the first true influencer by living a remarkable life. She had power, real power, and longevity influencing generations. Her name, Elizabeth Taylor. I know she was loud. I know she was hysterically funny. I know she swore. But Elizabeth said how painfully shy she was. She went on perfume tours, and the places were mobbed just to see her. She was starting to try and take control of her life, but then tragedy and life kind of got in the way. I'm Katy Perry, and Elizabeth Taylor has fascinated, inspired, and influenced me as an artist, woman, and an advocate. This is the story of the original influencer. This is Elizabeth the First. Influencer. It's a word that gets tossed around a lot these days. There is a woman who went the distance, who broke ground as the first true influencer by living a remarkable life. Her name, Elizabeth Taylor. I'm Katy Perry. This is the story of the original influencer. This is Elizabeth the first. Elizabeth the first, the podcast, wherever you listen. We're getting ready to leave town, but I want to make one more stop before we go. Well, hello again. Hi. How you doing? Good. You guys get some sleep? Great sleep. I don't sleep really. <laughs> it's not in my nature. I have nature. a hard time too. Yeah. Rob and Jacqueline Farr offered to show us around their land. This is Texas heat. Good afternoon. How are you? You look so glamorous. Oh, well, I don't know yeah. about that. I'm sweating. Just don't touch me too great. much. Since retiring, yeah. Rob is enrolled in a federal program that subsidizes landowners to make their backyards more wildlife friendly. It brings them a lot of joy. When I retired, I wanted to be able to work the land and improve it for wildlife. So every piece of property has what they call a carrying capacity, how much wildlife it will support, depending on the food, cover, water, and things like that. If you improve your habitat, your carrying capacity goes up. Conservation is clearly in his blood. The kinds of wildlife that you've probably already seen and that you're gonna keep seeing each year that you do this is gonna be incredible. It's like you got front row seats. Yeah, and then on top of what I do with the program that I signed up with the federal government, I also plant food plots. And then sometimes the wildlife is looking for something green to eat. 
but I get more enjoyment out of sitting there watching them eat the stuff that I planted for them. I don't know, it just makes me feel good. Rob and Jacqueline also spend a lot of time looking after their grandkids, teaching them about land stewardship and the importance of reciprocity with nature. Jacqueline has the kids help her plant and help her harvest. Because a lot of kids, they just think vegetables come in a can. can. They have no idea that you actually grow it. A hundred years from now, what do you want this land to be if you had your way of kind of leading it forward? Well, it's, it's kind of funny you should ask that. That conversation came up between our daughters and ourselves. Now, it's going to be transferred to the girls, and they know how we feel about the land, and they right on board. But what I want to do eventually, I would like for them to deed it to the Potawatomi Nation and then see if maybe that can be put in trust because all Native American land, the reservations are in trust. I haven't done it yet because Missouri doesn't have any recognized tribes, but uh, that's when I'm mulling over when we're dead and gone. She likes pictures. Me, Rob, and Aaron are squished into Rob's ATV. Are you ready? Let's do it. As we drive through crunchy brush and trudge through soggy creeks, I marvel at the rich variety of trees. Uh, sycamore. See the one with the white, the white solid bark up there? But my mind sycamore keeps drifting back to the paddlefish. There are so many different types of oaks. How these ancient creatures have defied the odds for millions of years. That oak tree over here are two different species of oaks. Swimming in these waters from the time T-Rex roamed the earth to when the Osage, Sioux, Kaskaskia, and Kickapoo nations managed these lands. These fish have witnessed gun battles on the banks of Warsaw during the Civil War. They have survived the opening of Truman Dam, which hurt their ability to spawn. The most resilient paddlefish can grow to over 100 pounds and live long enough to have a midlife crisis, and much longer than that. They might even outlive our own species if we fail to rise to the huge challenges presented by climate change. But they're in an ongoing battle with fishermen, trying to gouge a hook through their mouths and wrestle them to a merciless death for sport, tradition, or profit. We come to a stop in this huge meadow on a hill. We're looking at a couple acres of grassland, surrounded by trees. The place is brimming with wild mullein, goldenrod, and other beautiful wildflowers and native plants. Monarch butterflies and bumblebees float from leaf to leaf. This is a forager's dream. I'm not just saying this to you, this is unreal. This is like at least the size of a football field, if not bigger, and it's, we're, we're on a prairie the way it probably was hundreds of years ago, and it's the biodiversity that's likely here is just like teeming. I'm blown away. Rob has slowly restored this place by hand and with great care. It's breathtaking. How many times you wonder whether you are or not, you know, how much you're actually improving things, but it's all worth it to me. Yeah, well, clearly nature's listening because it seems to be responding to what you're doing. <laughs> well, that's so. a good way to put it. I, yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Whatever else is true, what's really at stake in this story is the fate of these vulnerable fish and the responsibility we hold towards the natural world around us. It doesn't matter where you're from, we all share in that duty. Despite all the snagging and bragging, the crime and the greed, as long as there are people like Rob and Jacqueline far in the world, people who want to honor nature in all its forms, that leaves me feeling hopeful. And if our own species is to survive, we need hope. Paddlefish Caviar Heist is a production of Imperative Entertainment 
and Vespucci, and is written and hosted by me, Helen Hollingman. For Imperative Entertainment, the executive producer is Jason Hoke. For Vespucci, the executive producers are Daniel Turkin and Johnny Galvin. David Gavi Herbert is executive producer. Based on original reporting by David Gavi Herbert. The series producer is Aaron Keller. The story editor is Matt Willis. Thomas Curry is the managing producer. Audio recording by Austin Sizzler at Eastside Studios. Audio mix and sound design by Matt Peaty. And special thanks to Phil Domahovsky, who got me started on this wild and crazy adventure. Thank you.